All right, welcome everyone to Discover Your Root Cause, how to heal from your autoimmune disease. My name is Annie Rubin. I am a registered dietitian, a nutritionist, and um, I'm really excited to explore this topic with you today. So this hopefully won't, will take about an hour or so, um, but I have a lot to cover. And, um, you know, if you have questions throughout the, uh, throughout the event, you know, feel free to drop them in the chat and I will try to answer them as we go along, or I will at least answer them, um, when we, when we conclude. Okay. So the big, why, you know, why, why do we care about root causes? Like, why does that even matter? So if you're living with a chronic disease, you know that it's a constant struggle. Sometimes it seems impossible for you to live a normal life. Um, but here's the thing, autoimmune diseases don't just happen out of the blue. Something usually has to trigger it. And conventional medicine, unfortunately, doesn't focus on the why, they focus on the, the what. You know, what is the disease doing to your body? How can we make the symptoms go away? You know, the things that we experience with autoimmune diseases, the fatigue, the inflammation, the digestive issues, the joint pain, the skin rashes, um, medications, you know, address those visible symptoms instead of addressing the reason why it's happening in the first place. But in order for us to fully heal, we need to focus on the why. Why is my body attacking itself? Why is there chronic inflammation? So by understanding your root cause or your root causes of your disease, that will help you fix your body. So today we are going to talk about a few of the main, most common root causes of autoimmune diseases. We are going to discuss, um, you know, ways to test for these and how to kind of uncover which, what may be your own root cause. And then we'll focus on the next steps in healing. So thank for if you guys just joined me today. Um, thank you for joining me. And um, I also forgot to mention, if you can put your, all yourselves on mute, that would be helpful just to avoid any background noise. Okay, so just a really you know basic overview of autoimmune diseases if you're not familiar with what they are. Um, so basically what happens is that your immune system attacks your healthy cells, tissues, and or organs, depending on what type of disease you have. Normally your immune cells can tell the difference between yourself and your non-self um, with the exception of, of some lymphocytes. And everyone has these lymphocytes. Everyone has lymphocytes that actually um, are kind of geared toward attacking themselves. Um, and you know, in most healthy people, these lymphocytes are suppressed. However, when you have an autoimmune disease, either lymph the lymphocytes are not fully suppressed or the body tissue changes and is seen as an invader by the immune system, which triggers an attack. So there's two types of autoimmune diseases. They like to kind of group them into two different categories. They're either organ or non-organ. And some of these, these diseases fit really neatly into these categories, while others kind of fall somewhere in the middle. So when we think about organ autoimmune diseases, we think of where one organ is attacked. So for instance, like Hashimoto's or, or um, Graves disease that attacks your thyroid, Addison's disease attacks your adrenal gland, type one diabetes attacks your pancreas. And then there is the non-organ um, autoimmune diseases. So that's when your immune system attacks are more widespread, such as we find in lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. So it's really unclear, you know, what causes the immune attack, but, um, you know, typically there, it, it's something, it's something that has triggered your body to do that. And, you know, while there are no cures for autoimmune diseases right now, um, you are able to put it into remission. Um, sometimes people go into remission with medication, sometimes it's lifestyle and diet, sometimes it's a little bit of both. But I do find that when you kind of start uncovering your root cause, you are more likely to put your disease into remission. So some statistics about autoimmune diseases, um, an estimated 50 million Americans suffer from autoimmune diseases. 80% um, or more of these, of people with autoimmune diseases are women. 25% um, of people with autoimmune diseases have at least three of them. It's known as a cluster disease. Uh, and um, it takes an average of about four years to get a diagnosis. Um, and this was a survey done by the Autoimmune Association. And in the people that they... Um, that they surveyed, 45% of those people were told that they were chronic complainers in their early stages of their illness uh, um, or disease. 
And then what's also really interesting and unfortunate is that the rates of autoimmune diseases in the US are actually um, on the rise. So my personal story, before we kind of jump into the, the meat of this presentation, um, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in 2008. Um, I literally could not get out of bed. I had no energy. I was in pain. Um, like my shoulders, like I could not like physically like roll over and get out of bed. I used, I was an Ironman triathlete. I ran marathons. Um, I was very active. And so it was pretty devastating to kind of all of a sudden wake up and not be able to, to move my body. Um, so my disease, you know, went into remission pretty quickly, um, just with medication. And this is before I was a dietitian. This is actually my second career, but I did ask at that point, you know, if there's any connection between diet and lifestyle and healing. And I was told that there wasn't. Um, and so when my kids were born, my rheumatoid arthritis flared again. And that's kind of when I started to explore alternative treatments using my now nutrition background. And, um, you know, my biggest challenge was energy, you know, and joint pain, but mostly energy. I was always tired. I had two kids, you know, trying to take care of them running around with them. It was really hard to be a mom. So, you know, I started over time, the last couple of years, I've been addressing my own root causes to really break through my autoimmune symptoms. And I've had, you know, quite a good response in doing that. And, um, you know, that is why I kind of started my private practice to address nutrition with autoimmune diseases. And then, um, you know, I think it's important that everyone has the, the knowledge and the tools to kind of, um, to be able to um, investigate, you know, their own root causes to see if they can help themselves. Okay, so these are the four root causes we're gonna talk about. Um, we'll talk about environmental exposures, um, gastrointestinal issues, stress, and then diet. So the first one, environmental exposures, this includes things like heavy metals, chemical exposures, mold, and medications. So heavy metals, um, there have been many reports of heavy metal induced autoimmune diseases um, over the last four decades. While it's not really fully understood how this happens, um, metals have both an immunosuppressant capability and they can cause issues with your lymphocytes. Um, so the three kind of common um, exposures that we see with people who have autoimmune diseases are lead, silver, and mercury. So ways that you get exposed to these, um, lead can le leach into your drinking water from old pipes or from contaminated soil. Lead is also found in some dishware and cookware. Um, I know it's found in like, you know, if you ever use like your old crystal goblets that may have lead in them, and that's how you can get exposed to it. Um, silver, is really, it's found in a lot of things, but people who are at a high risk are those who work with silver daily. So think about people who work with jewelry, um, silver mining, or even photographic processing. Silver can also be found in medications, um, silver fillings, and then some dietary supplements actually contain silver. And then mercury is a very common one. It's found in large predatory fish like tuna and swordfish, um, dental amal amalgams or dental fillings, and then thermometers. Chemical exposures is also, you know, we are surrounded by chemicals in this kind of industrial world that we live in. Um, since the 1950s, chemical production have, has increased by 50 fold. Um, so there are now uh, like 350,000 or over 350,000 chemicals used today in everyday products. And only a fraction of those have actually been tested for um, health and safety. So ways that you can get exposed through chemicals are by using plastics, um, certain cookware like uh, Teflon or nonstick cookware has those forever chemicals in them. Uh, personal care products is a big one. Um, I'm also a beauty counter consultant and their job is really to remove all chemicals from personal care products. Um, it's kind of their advocacy role. So um, that's a big one where we find a lot of chemicals that people just aren't aware of. Cleaning products too can have a lot of, of harmful chemicals in them. And then pesticides, obviously. And then some other ones include things like flame retardants, um, any chemicals used in like furniture making, mattresses, textiles, clothing, and then also air pollution. Um, so 
there's a lot of places you can find chemicals and you can kind of drive yourself nuts trying to limit the amount of chemical exposure you have. Um, but one of the really important ones to consider are th uh, is this class of chemicals called endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. Um, and so Dr. Laura Shaheen, who is a leading expert in fertility, and she's done a lot of research on these endocrine disrupting chemicals. She kind of, she came out and said, endocrine disrupting chemicals are the new tobacco. I mean, that is how um, horrible they are for our bodies. And especially if you have an autoimmune disease or, you know, are susceptible to one, um, it can really interfere with a lot of different um, body systems. So one of the things it does is it interferes with hormone signaling. So if you're not familiar with what hormones do, they are kind of like the traffic lights in your body. They signal everything, you know, to, to function properly and to move and, um, to, you know, increase certain chemicals in your body and decrease certain chemicals in your body. So when those get disrupted, it can kind of throw your entire body balance out of whack. Um, there was also a really interesting review article in 2012 that said that um, endocrine disrupting chemicals can affect the immune system and they can actually dampen or overexcite it and they can trigger inflammation in the body. Um, and then the other thing that they do is they also deplete glutathione, which is your body's most potent antioxidant. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in detail in a minute. Um, the other thing that uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals can do is they can um, interfere with your estrogen levels. So for women, estrogen can either be um, protective or inflammatory when it comes to autoimmune conditions. Different diseases are affected by either an increase or a drop in estrogen levels. So depending on kind of um, what type of autoimmune disease you have, when your estrogen levels get out of whack, that can actually um, trigger inflammation. So for instance, low estrogen levels are inflammatory for rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis and Hashimoto's. Um, and uh, they've also been shown to, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals that can um, trigger autoimmune diseases for, for these types of um, you know, specific diseases. Uh, the other thing that they do is they attack, um, they can be harmful to beta cells which makes them more vulnerable to attack. And your beta cells are the ones that are kind of um, what get attacked with type one diabetes. And then mold is something that um, isn't talked about a lot, but it can really do a number on your body. Um, so mold is a spore that typically grows in a damp environment, but it also can flourish in heat. Um, so depending on the type of mold. Um, most molds are harmless, but there are some that can be incredibly harmful because they release um, something called a mycotoxin, which are chemicals that are inflammatory. So mold can trigger an autoimmune attack because it also may, uh, depletes antioxidants in your body and specifically glutathione. So glutathione is your most potent antioxidant and, um, and antioxidants in general work to protect your body against inflammation and free radicals. So when that has that protective mechanism goes away and you can't produce enough antioxidants, it makes your body more susceptible to oxidative stress, which can then cause tissue damage. It can cause acute and chronic inflammation and then systemic illnesses such as autoimmune diseases. Um, so where do we find mold? Um, the biggest kind of offender are, is your own home. Um, if you've ever had water damage, um, if your home is old, it's something that you, you know, may want to consider getting tested. Um, mold can grow on anything that has paper. So think like paper, cardboard, um, it can be in dust. It can be in carpet. It can be in furniture. Laundry machines are a big place where we find mold. Um, mold can also be in food. So like preservative free juice boxes is one where, you know, if you can't see inside the juice box and, you know, a lot of us don't want our kids to drink chemicals. So these companies that come out with preservative free juice boxes, but mold can actually grow in there because there's no preservatives in that to kind of protect against um, bacterial growth. So that is one kind of scary place to think about. Um, other places are, uh, other foods are cereals, breads, um, beans, peanuts, and coffee. Coffee is actually a common one where you can find mold. And then lastly, medications. So medically induced autoimmunity is a well 
known side effect of, of a number of medications more than you would suspect. Uh, the research actually goes back to 1945 when it was discovered that certain medications um, induce lupus. So if you kind of go on PubMed and you Google medically induced autoimmunity, lupus is the one that usually comes up. It's one of the most well-studied uh, medication triggering autoimmune disease. Um, and it now has over 90 medications and 10 drug classes that can trigger um, lupus. So one theory of, of why this happens is that um, certain medications can affect the DNA methylation in your body, which then can lead to autoimmunity. Um, but there have been cases of um, drug-induced autoimmunity with um, biologics and statins. Um, sometimes people who have specific genetic traits are more susceptible to these medications triggering an autoimmune disease. Um, and in addition to, if you have an autoimmune disease, it makes you more susceptible to developing another one. So if sometimes medications, you know, especially biologics is a common medication that you're given for an autoimmune disease, um, taking that medication, you know, may actually trigger another autoimmune disease. So you always just have to be really careful about um, medications and, um, and your use of them. And we'll talk about that, you know, ways to kind of get around that in a minute or a little bit later. Okay, the next root cause is gastrointestinal issues, which is a big one. Um, I would say I have not yet met a patient or a client of mine that does not have gastrointestinal issues kind of alongside their autoimmune disease. So um, the four kind of general areas where we have issues include um, impaired digestion and absorption, um, leaky gut, which is a big one, um, dysbiosis, and then small, bact small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. So as Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. He was a pretty smart guy even way back then. Um, so there are several reasons why GI issues can trigger an autoimmune disease. And the overarching theme is, is that your body has issues digesting and absorbing food. And so how does this happen? Um, so it could be, you know, just that your body isn't creating enough of the digestive support mechanisms that it needs to fully digest food. So things like having low stomach acid, um, not, not creating enough um, enzymes from your pancreas, um, insufficient bile production to help uh, digest fats, and then just having an impaired gut in general, which we'll talk about next. So what happens when you don't absorb your nutrients from your food is it makes you susceptible to micronutrient deficiencies and your immune system needs specific micronutrients to function. Um, there's a number of them that kind of work in the process of supporting your auto, your, um, your immune system. The ones that are, have the most evidence for this are vitamins D, C, and zinc, but other ones include vitamin A, vitamin E, uh, B6, B12, folate, zinc, or I said zinc, iron, copper, and selenium. The other big kind of one issue that people most, I would say 99.9% .9 of my clients have is a leaky gut. Um, so a leaky gut is, is technically, it's like the, the common term for intestinal permeability. So basically what happens is in your GI tract, you have these cells and they are connected by what we call tight junctions. And, um, they prevent things from coming into your body. Cause if you think about your gastrointestinal tract from your mouth, mouth all the way down to your anus, it is an open tube, right? I mean, it has some organs, it goes through your stomach and, you know, through your intestines, but it's really open to the, to the outside world. And so it's like your one way to protect your body from the things that you ingest and your intestinal lining is supposed to, you know, have a very strong barrier to keep things out that shouldn't get in. So what happens when you have these weak junctions is that, um, things sneak through into circulation and can trigger an immune response because they're foreign things that are coming into your body that you're not aware of. And then your body attacks it. Um, leaky gut is also associated with dys dysbiosis, which we'll talk about next. Um, but it is one of the hallmark symptoms and um, believed pathogenesis of autoimmune disease. So there's a number of triggers that can um, cause leaky gut. A big one is diet. So this graphic 
came from a research article that um, talked about kind of the Western diet of fast food and high sugar and salt and, and um, processed meat um, and candy and how that kind of creates um, leaky gut. Other things like stress, alcohol, medications, intense exercise, and then certain viruses and infections can actually also trigger intestinal permeability. Um, and then dysbiosis. So dysbiosis refers to our gut microbiome, which has been, you know, kind of the big buzzword lately. Um, but the, our gut microbiome refers to the billions and trillions of bacteria that make up your, that make your lar their large intestine their home. So the bacteria in your large intestine play a really crucial role in our overall health. Um, a lot of th some things that they do that, that impact us include, they help us digest fiber, they um, produce short chain fatty acids, acids which help support the gut health. Um, and th those in turn actually help fight inflammation. They communicate with our immune cells. And then they also affect our nervous, our central nervous system and our brain health. So dysbiosis occurs when you have an imbalance of these good and bad bacteria in the large intestine. Um, because they, they typically live in harmony and there's, you always have a balance of good and bad, but when that gets out of whack, um, things, you know, that is, essentially is dysbiosis. So it can occur for a number of reasons. Um, it can occur by, um, you know, losing good bacteria or producing too much bad bacteria or losing both good and bad bacteria and having your diversity plummet. Um, so it's typically caused by eating a nutrient poor diet. Um, stress can actually affect dysbiosis and then certain medications can as well. So signs and symptoms of dysbiosis include, you know, bowel movement issues. So like constipation, diarrhea, gas, bloating, abdominal pain. Those are kind of the obvious ones. And the other not so obvious ones are things like rashes and um, food cravings. So that may be a sign that you have dysbiosis. And then SIBO is the last one. So SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. This is when um, it's, it's basically what it, what it says. You have um, bacteria overgrowth in your small intestine. So your small intestine shouldn't have bacteria in it, but when your large intestine gets your, your, you know, so out of whack, like your dysbiosis gets really severe, you can actually have bacteria start to grow up into your, um, or colonize your, your small intestine. So that can be a trigger of leaky gut. It's a, you know, essentially a type of dysbiosis. Um, and it's an underlying trigger of, of a number of um, autoimmune diseases as well. Things like inflammatory bowel disease, scleroderma, Hashimoto's, and rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, stress is the third root cause. Um, and this seems like, it shouldn't be, I don't know. It's, you know, we're all stressed, right? So why doesn't everyone have an autoimmune disease if stress is a trigger? Um, but again, you know, there's some genetic component to autoimmune diseases and then something has to tip it over the edge. And um, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of studies that have, you know, prospective studies where patients, there's like 80% of patients in these studies said that they experienced an abnormal emotional physical stress right before the onset of their disease. Um, I know a number of my clients have also said this where they had so much stress that it kind of tipped them over the edge and they developed a disease. Um, and it's not just um, autoimmune diseases, it's the um, it's cause of, of many chronic diseases. And I think a lot of us don't realize how stressed out we are until we actually start addressing it. Um, so these, these are three books that I actually love that talk about kind of the connection between um, stress and disease. Um, when the Body Says No by Gabor Mate, um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky, and then The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Klok. So, or Kolk, sorry. So those are, you know, if you're interested in learning about more, um, I mean, there's a lot of research on this topic, but those are some three of my favorite books on this. Um, and so what does, what does stress do? So stress affects and specifically chron chronic stress it affects our HPA axis. So your HPA axis is stands for hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. It basically re regulates your stress response. So your HPA axis actually works as a feedback loop. 
to both initiate and dampen a stress response. However, when you're undergoing a lot of stress or you have chronic stress, this feedback loop stops working and your body is unable to shut down the stress response. So when this happens, um, cortisol, which is one of your major stress hormones, it stops working properly. Um, your body actually becomes desensitized to cortisol and, um, and then it just doesn't kind of recognize it anymore. And cortisol is actually an, an anti-inflammatory hormone. So when your body stops recognizing this as an anti-inflammatory hor hormone, inflammation then happens for, you know, a variety of reasons. Um, cortisol actually also plays a, an important role in regulating the immune system. So again, if your body is desensitized to cortisol, you're going to have like a, um, an imbalanced immune response, and it's not going to quite work properly. The other thing that stress does, it affects your gut health. So stress can actually, um, affect the balance of your gut microbiome. Um, so if you have a lot of stress, it can actually kind of promote, um, the growth of more harmful bacteria, uh, it triggers leaky gut. So cortisol can actually increase intestinal permeability. So if you're constantly having a cortisol being produced in your body, it can trigger a leaky gut. And then, um, it also, stress can also cause inflammation in the intestines. So there's one study that showed that, um, inc that there's increased inflammation in, um, inflammatory bowel disease patients who are undergoing a lot of stress. And I actually just did, if you follow me on Instagram, I did a, a whole talk on the, on stress yesterday. So you can go back to my Instagram and, um, and watch that. Okay. The last one is diet. So food actually was really interesting because it connects to a lot of the other root causes. Um, so for one thing, food can affect your gut microbiome composition. Um, food can trigger leaky gut as well, and it can, you know, cause GI issues. Um, food can be stressful on the body as well, depending on what you eat. Food may contain pesticides, chemicals, or it could be stored in plastics that contain endocrine disrupting chemicals. And then food may actually lack essential micronutrients that you need for your immune system to function, and it can be inflammatory in itself. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this. So microbiome, um, your diet can shift your gut microbiome um, composition, which is awesome, right? Because if you are experiencing dysbiosis, you can actually use food to correct it. But on the flip side, if you're not eating a great diet, that can actually trigger dysbiosis. Um, so there was a study that, pu that was published in um, Nature in 2013 that found that the gut microbiome can shift pretty dramatically and quickly in response to dietary changes. So the study also found that um, diet changes to the gut microbiome may contribute to inflammatory diseases, specifically inflammatory bowel disease. And because these microbes are so adaptable, it's important that we include foods in our diet to keep them balanced and happy. So there was a, a quote there that I pulled from the, the study that said, short-term composition of um, diets composed entirely of um, animal or plant products can alter the microbiome, microbial community structure. And then in another study, um, which was published in the Gut Journal of 2021, it found that specific nutrients have um, pro-inflammatory effects in the gut microbiome, while others have the opposite effect. So specifically animal-derived foods and processed foods caused a higher growth of opportunistic bacteria, that were linked to inflammation and intestinal inflammatory markers, while plant-based foods were linked to, um, to short chain fatty acid producers, which have an anti-inflammatory effect on the body and help regulate the immune system. So a number of foods can also trigger intestinal permeability. And I had mentioned this before about kind of the standard Western diet doing that, but to kind of dig a little bit deeper at things like preservatives, um, emulsifiers, which are found in a lot of processed and baked foods to kind of help stabilize, um, ingredients together, salt, sugar, gluten, um, alcohol, artificial sweeteners and processed oils to name a few. And then the other kind of interesting thing about, um, food is that uh, many people with autoimmune diseases also have food sensitivities. Um, and it's kind of 
you know, it goes back to the fact that almost all of us have a leaky gut. And when you have a leaky gut, you absorb undigested food particles because more things can sneak through that lining easier. So you don't have to be fully digested. Um, and then your immune system may see that food as an invader and mount an attack on it. And so there was an observational study that in 2017 that found that um, the difference, uh, there was a difference in food tolerance profiles between healthy people and autoimmune subjects. Um, they basically found that autoimmune patients had more sensitivities to things like cow milk and casein and wheat and um, egg whites and rice versus the healthy people who didn't have reactions. Okay, so how, now that we've kind of covered all of the root causes, how do you, how do you, how do you figure out what is your root cause, right? Because everyone is different. Everyone, um, you know, develop their autoimmune disease in a different manner. So what are some ways that we can kind of uncover different root causes to see if that is the one for us? Um, so most of these do require some functional testing. Um, and I would recommend going through a medical practitioner, either like a functional doctor, someone who's, you know, involved in integrative health. There are a lot of dietitians who do a number of these tests. Um, so you just find someone who is, um, you know, qualified and who you trust. But, um, so looking at environmental exposures, there's a number of tests that you can do, um, that are urine-based tests. Um, heavy metal mold and chemicals are all, you know, urine-based tests that you can do at home. They're fairly easy. The two companies that um, I've typically used are Doctors Data and um, Vibrant Wellness. Um, for mold, uh, you can also do a urine test for mold. Um, I would also recommend, and we'll, we'll talk about it kind of in, in next steps, but getting your, your home tested if you are concerned that you may have mold in your home or if you know that you have had water damage in the past, um, it might be a good idea to get that tested. Um, getting chemicals is, is a urine test. And then with medications, you know, um, every, anytime you start any medication, you know, you want to pay extra attention to how you feel. Um, try not to add any new things in at that same time. And you want to give it up to about four weeks to see if you notice any symptoms. Um, I would also ask your doctor about side effects. Um, you know, we kind of talk about being your own health advocate in my repair group program, which I'll talk about in a minute, but I think that's, you know, a lot of us don't, um, ask the questions that we need to ask in the doctor's office, either because we're afraid or we're nervous or, um, you know, I don't know for whatever reason, and we need to ask more questions. So definitely don't be afraid to, to ask. Um, with gastrointestinal issues, again, you know, there's a number of functional tests that you can do. Um, the most popular one is a stool test um, that looks at your gut microbiome. So there's a few companies, again, that I've used, Vibrant Wellness, GI Map, Genova are the three that I, uh, that I like. Um, these tests can actually look, depending on which one you do, um, they can actually look, take a really deep dive into your digestive function. So they can look at your enzyme production. They can look at stomach acid production. Um, they can look at inflammation in the gut to see, you know, if you do have leaky gut or anything going on that you need to address there. And then they also look at your microbiome composition to see where, you know, how balanced it is. Um, and I think that can be, you know, really helpful if, if you are concerned about kind of your gastrointestinal health and if it's balanced or not, because again, but just by changing your diet or maybe taking a few different targeted probiotics, you can, you can change that, that colonies, those colonies for the better. Um, if you suspect that you have SIBO, you can do a SIBO breath test, which, which is, a um, the most common one they use is lactulose. Um, it's basically a, a three hour test that you breathe into like a tube after you drink a solution of lactulose and it can, it can check for, they're looking for hydrogen and, and methane production because that's what the, bac the bacteria produce in your um, small intestine. Uh, and then you can do, uh, for gastrointestinal issues, you can also look at um, a micronutrient panel to make sure that you're you know, absorbing all the nutrients that you're eating. And that's typically a blood test. Um, or you could do an organic acid test, which looks at um, the metabolic processes in your body um, that's a urine test. So some people prefer to do that. It's not as comprehensive, but you can pull out some nutrients and look at nutrient deficiencies from that. And then stress. So, um, I mean, 
many of us probably know if we're stressed or chronically stressed. If you don't, then um, you know it might be something to explore or even test. So there's something called the Dutch test, which you can do. Um, it tests for hormones. So it can look at actually your sex hormones because your, um, I didn't mention this before, but your HPA axis actually is responsible for managing and controlling and regulating your sex hormones as well. So it can track that. Um, it can track, it looks for cortisol and melatonin. So if you're having like trouble sleeping or you're constantly tired, that might be a good test to look into. Um, and then you can look for other, you know, symptoms of stress, things like irritability, um, panic attacks, um, sleep issues, fatigue, anxiety, depression, diarrhea, constipation, menstrual issues, um, muscle aches and pains, high blood pressure, feeling of loneliness, overwhelm, chest pain. There's a lot of signs of, of stress. So, um, that's kind of, you know, again, one to look into. And then with diet, you know, again, you can use like the microbiome test to look at your gut microbiome, uh, micronutrient testing, and then food sensitivity testing. So I typically do one or all of these with my, with my clients, um, both one-on-one -on -one and in my group program, um, food sensitivity tends to be the one that is the most common choice because testing gets expensive. So you kind of have to pick and choose which ones you want to do, but, um, I've had really great results with that one with my, with myself and with my, um, with my clients as well. Okay. So next steps in healing. Um, before I jump into that, I just want to briefly talk about my repair group program because I am starting up another group program, um, in July after the 4th of July kind of week. So this program is for you. If you are tired of your autoimmune disease, getting in the way of you becoming your best self, um, living, if you live in a state where I cannot provide you with, um, private counseling. So I am restricted in some States to do, um, one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, because of licensing issues, but, um, in a group setting, I'm able to get around that. So, um, this is kind of my workaround to help more people. And then if you're looking to connect with others who share your same health struggles, and again, you know, I kind of accept all people who are struggling with autoimmune diseases. So they may not have the same one that you have, but, um, I think it's always just helpful to be in the room with people who kind of understand what you're going through. Like I never had that when I was first diagnosed. Um, I actually like didn't talk about it at all. And, um, I think it, it kind of held me back in terms of healing because it's really important to have a connection and, um, you know, to accept and to move forward with your, with your disease. Um, and then if you want a more holistic approach to your healing journey. So my repair program, it's a three month program. Um, I basically like created it, um, to mimic what I do with my one-on-one -on -one clients. So, you know, with my one-on-one -on -one clients, I, we, they have a three month program option. Um, and again, you know, I, I really kind of love this, a holistic approach to healing because we, we not only talk about diet, we talk about lifestyle. We talk about, um, you know, stress management and sleep and supplements and, um, how to be your own health advocate and how to cook in the kitchen and how to meal plan. I mean, there's a lot that kind of goes into this program and you're going to learn a ton of information about how to, you know, manage your disease and with diet, but also lifestyle and how to move forward and how to, how to heal. Um, so we'll have weekly group collaborative sessions. Um, you get two private coaching sessions with me. Um, you have a built-in support network. Um, you do have the option to do biomedical testing, which, you know, includes like the food sensitivity testing, gut microbiome testing, micronutrient testing, or kind of the three that I use, um, recipes and meal plans. You get unlimited messaging to me, um, in between sessions, you get discount on supplements. And then, um, I bring in guest speakers to talk about things that I am not experts on. So, um, again, it's, it's a pretty well-rounded comprehensive program. So I had just finished up my, my last program in, um, end of May. And this is what a couple of people in the program had to say. Um, Stacy was, you know, when she joined the program, she was very hesitant about doing it. She didn't think food was really going to make that much of a difference, but she was like, I have nothing to lose. I might as well try. And, um, now she is a different person. She feels 95% better. 
she's no longer depressed. Um, she has a happier outlook on life. She, you know, with her family and her kids, they actually see that she's happier, which is amazing. And this program has made a huge impact on her life. So I'm so thrilled with her, her, um, experience with it. And then another one of my clients, Anna, um, so she feels more comfortable in her own skin. She's better at balancing her, um, you know, protein, veggies, and carbs, and better about making specific choices about, um, what food feels good in her body. And she said, um, my human touch is her special sauce, which is very nice. Okay. So how do you enroll? So, um, enrollment, it should be up on my, on my website today. Um, you basically just go to, um, my website, annierubin.com and then to services and then to re the repair group program. Um, you basically just fill out a short application form and then we'll set up a discovery call. So, um, if you're unable to find a time that works for you, just, you know, shoot me an email and we will figure out a time to just chat briefly. I want to make sure I do this because I want to make sure that people understand what they're getting into and that it's a good fit for them. I don't want people to sign up for this who don't, who don't, it ends up not being a good fit because then that makes me sad. And, you know, it's just, it's better if I talk to you first. So, um, that's, you know, the, honestly, the reason why I do the application process, just to kind of have that conversation with you to make sure that, yes, this would be a good fit for you, or maybe you're better off in a one-on-one -on -one session with me. So um, we can kind of make that determination. Uh, and then the investment in the program. So the, right now through July 10th, um, you'll get the early bird pricing of $9.97. Um, it's usually $12.97. And then um, the course value is I mean, over $8,000. So you're getting a really great deal here on, um, you know, getting to work with me. So early bird pricing ends July 10th at midnight. Okay. So jumping into um, next steps for healing. So, um, you know, it does take on average about seven, seven to 12 years for an autoimmune disease to fully develop. So what I always kind of encourage people to do is to create a health history timeline. Not only will it be helpful for you, but it'll be helpful for any practitioner that you work with. Um, you want to think about kind of, you know, potential triggers along, along the way where symptoms started popping up, um, and just kind of, you know, the trajectory of your disease and when things started, you know, becoming a parent when you were diagnosed, all of those things. Um, and then, you know, try to find a healthcare practitioner who can help guide you through testing. Um, you know, I'm like fully comfortable doing, you know, the diet side, the food sensitivity testing. Um, I've done the gut testing, um, micronutrient, even Dutch testing, which is like the stress and hormone stuff um, with kind of chemical and environmental exposures that that gets a little bit trickier. So, um, I would, I typically would, um, refer people to like a functional or integrative doctor to kind of help them with that process. Because if like heavy metals is something that you, um, you have in your body, um, they use different kind of, um, prescriptions and medications and IVs to kind of treat that. So I, I'm not, I can't, I can't write prescriptions. So that is not on my end. Um, so you definitely want to find someone who, you like. And if you live in the Bay area, um, I personally see a functional medicine doctor and, um, she's wonderful. So I'm happy to give you her name if you need a recommendation. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things you can do on your own without seeing a professional and paying money for that. So if you think that you have, um, heavy metal exposure, um, you want to, again, you know, remove any exposures in your life to heavy metals. So that could be, you know, if you have mercury fillings, you want to go see a biological dentist or someone who is um, certified in removing dental amalgams. You definitely do not want to see a regular dentist to do this because you do not want to get, sometimes when you remove them, you get more exposed. So you want to make sure that it is handled properly and carefully. You want to avoid large predatory fish like tuna and swordfish to try to cut down your heavy metal consumption. Um, check your home and your water for lead because it can hide in old pipes. Um, again, certain glassware and dishes can have lead in it. So you just want to be careful about that. Check your um, supplements and medications for silver as well. Um, if chemicals is something that you are concerned about, you know, I always encourage people to buy organic or at least, you know, the dirty dozen, which is um, posted on the environmental working group web uh, website. So every year they post a list of the, the top 12 dirtiest 
uh, fruits and vegetables that you should try to buy organic if possible. Um, and then switch to safer cleaning and personal care products. Um, again, the Environmental Working Group has a great app that rates the products that you use in your home. Um, so that's an easy way to, to check. If you're interested in, um, in Beauty Counter, um, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to send you samples. I love their products. I love their line. I love everything about what the company stands for. So um, I'm happy to kind of help you in that area. And then another really easy thing to do is take your shoes off when you enter your home. Um, you probably don't realize that your shoes bring in a lot of dust and dirt and chemicals and you know, you're walking around outside, who knows what's on the sidewalk. So that is like a simple way to kind of reduce your chemical exposure is just take your shoes off before you enter your home. And then mold. So if you're concerned that you, um, that your house might have mold, you want to get your home um, ERMI tested. So ERMI stands for Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. Um, it was developed by the EPA to investigate mold in your home. Um, so not every mold inspector is uses an ERMI test. So you want to make sure that you choose one that does because that will, it's the most detailed um, test that you can find. Um, there are home kits that you can get for it too, or you can have someone professionally do it. Um, we actually had a mold issue in our home that we're still um, trying to deal with, but yeah, they had, you know, they came out and tested it and everything. And um, now we're just in the process of retesting to make sure they got it all. And then we can cut our drywall back up <laughs> and our home is like new construction or, you know, we gutted the whole thing and then there happened to be a leak in a window. So you never know. I mean, even if you live in a new home, there could be mold in it. So um, you just have to be careful and then avoid foods that have, that are susceptible to mold. Um, so that's, you know, a lot of like peanuts is, is one that's very common beans, coffee. You can actually, um, there's certain companies that you can look on their website and find um, mold testing that they've done for them. So um, if you Google like mold free coffee, you'll definitely get a number of brands. And then it's just a matter of, of finding the one for you. Um, I'm blanking on the one that I use right now. It's good. But um, if you email me, I can give it to you. I can't remember the name of it offhand, but I, I drink decaf. So I don't know, but they have great caffeinated too. Um, and then continuing with being, being your own healing guru um, diet, you know, it's a lot, believe me, it's a lot easier said than done, but by removing inflammatory foods for a period of time um, can make a huge difference. So you can always try that and see if, if that helps. If you need additional help, you can always reach out to me for questions. And then also ask your doctor for your basic vitamin and mineral labs. Um, there are you know a handful of labs that you can just have done and they should be very routine. Um, and then you also just want to focus on plants and clean animal protein. Um, I always say eat like a plant forward diet. So eat lots of vegetables, eat the rainbow fiber. You always want to have fiber in your diet because that helps feed your gut microbiome. And then, um, I have nothing against animal protein. I eat animal protein, but you just want to make sure it's, it's grass fed, organic, wild caught, you know, clean, um, as long as you can afford it. The second one is stress management. So this is um, very personal. You have to find something that works for you. Um, if you wanna go back to my Instagram live from, from yesterday, you can, um, I talked about a different bunch of different ways you can start managing your stress better, but um, you know, find something that works, try a bunch of things, meditation, deep breathing, therapy, cold showers, um, Wim Hof method, um, grounding, being outside. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of tools you can have in your toolbox. So you got to just figure out what, what works best for you. Cause everyone's different. And then lastly, um, exercise. So focus on gentle movement. Um, anything very intense can actually increase intestinal permeability. So you want to make sure that you don't do anything that's like way too intense to kind of keep your body moving, but not, you know, stress it out too much because exercise can be a stressor. All right, so this is my contact information, um, my email, email me at any time if you have questions. My website has a lot of great information on there, including my blog, um, my Instagram handle, The Autoimmune Dietitian, and then Facebook, Annie Rubin Nutrition. Um, yeah, so that is that is how you reach me. And then um, there's a question in the chat. 
do any health insurers cover for your clients any expenses for your services generate? Um, so individually, uh, I can write you a Super Bowl. It depends on your on what state you live in, but um, I have had clients get reimbursed for working with me um, via a super bill. So they, you would pay me and then I basically give you a form that you'd have to submit to insurance. Um, the only thing that I need for, um, for, uh, whatchamacallit to write the super bill is a, um, a doctor's diagnostic code. So you like your physician can just, you know, give me a di diagnostic code of what you're struggling with. And then, um, I can get, I can write you a super bill for that. Um, and then if you guys can also just throw your, and you can do a direct message to me, if you want to throw your name and email in the chat, because if you attended live today, you, um, enter in a drawing to win a free coaching session with me. So, um, I'm going to try and write down all the names, um, right now, but, um, but yeah, in case I miss anyone. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Um, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. I was just under an hour. Perfect. So thank you so much for joining me today. Um, you know, this replay, I'm actually going to post this on, um, on my website, the video will be up for, I guess, through Saturday through Saturday night. So if you want to watch it again, in case you missed anything, I know there's a lot of content in today's, um, presentation. So if you wanted to go back and take notes on something or listen to it again, um, I can, um, yeah, it'll be up there. I think hopefully by this afternoon. Um, perfect. And that's it. So thanks for joining me. And um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions, shoot me an email, send me a message. Um, but thank you so much for attending today. I appreciate it.